Equity Office. So good afternoon, everyone joining us virtually and also in person. So before we begin, I do have a few announcements um, and acknowledgements as well. So um, I'd like to thank Paulina, Alejandra, Molly, um, and Tim and part of AV Services for making this event, this hybrid event possible, so thank you. We know a lot of work is done behind the scenes, so we definitely want to acknowledge all your help. Um, we want to thank um, the Provost, uh, Provost Cindy Barnhart and Interim Institute Community and Equity Officer um, Dan Hastings, who um, are both not here today, but again, for their um, institution and financial support. Um, we do have colleagues um, from Lincoln Lab joining us virtually, so welcome. Thank you for um, always participating and joining um, our events, even though you're all in Lexington, so we appreciate that. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, the Dean of School of Science who's joining us virtually, uh, Dean Nergis Mavalvala, so she's joining us virtually. Hi, Nergis, if you're there already, thank you for your support. Um, Faculty hosts, Professor Alan Guth and David Kaiser, so um, and the physics department. So I will tell you that um, the department head, Professor Deepto Chakrabarty, he actually forwarded this invitation to the entire physics department. So that's really, really appreciated. Um, and thank you again for your leadership support. So if you're other, if there are other faculty members from different departments. The bar has been raised. So definitely, we want to support our scholars, and that's a perfect way to do so. So thank you, Professor Chakrabarty, for, again, supporting um, um, our program, and especially our scholar, Morgan Koenig. So I also want to acknowledge our uh, current MLK visiting scholars. So some are joining us virtually. Some are here today with us in person. We have Wasilu Jaco. We have Angelino Viseza, Denise Frazier, Jean-Luc Pierrit. Um, and joining us virtually, I want to say, who do we have virtually? Um, Louis Masai is joining us virtually. I also want to acknowledge um, Professor Kenda Mutongi. So she was a former MLK scholar, now is full-time faculty in the Department of History, and she's also an MLK um, faculty advisory committee member. So again, she has definitely been very uh, front and center with this program. Um, who else is, oh, I also want to um, recognize uh, Professor Ed Birchinger. He is the former Institute Community Equity Officer and also a member of the Department of Physics. So thank you for joining us. Note, we will be recording this session. So for those who are unable to attend, we'll be able to see this recording. And um, if you wanted to view it again, definitely that's an option. Um, one of the final announcements is subscribe to our newsletter, ico.mit.edu. Paulina will be putting that in the chat um, function. This is an opportunity to learn more about our upcoming events. One that is happening also next week, I want to mention, it is uh, with Louis Messiah, Wednesday, October 18. It is hybrid, so you can join us virtually or in person in the same space at 12 o'clock. Um, and my final, final announcement is um, MIT is actually an institutional member of the National Center for Faculty Development and Diversity. So um, we are encouraging faculty, graduate students, postdocs to definitely sign up. It is free. So it is an online career development program and they have you have access to mentoring services. So that's really something really special. And again, wanna thank all the deans who actually financially supported this. So this was a really school-wide effort or institute-wide effort. So just wanna put that out there. Now, we are having in person some food from Car Carolinas, which is Venezuelan food. Don't worry, those joining us virtually, even though you can't um, eat some Venezuelan food, we definitely want to share a meal with you, although virtually. So Paulina is going to put an Uber Eats voucher for those joining us. So please feel free to use it at your own leisure. You have about 48, 72 hours, three days. 72 hours to use it. So again, if you can't join us in person, definitely grab a meal on ICO on the MLK Scholars Program. So without further ado, who is our speaker? Morgan Koenig. Koenig first joined the Center for Theoretical Physics at MIT in December 2021 as a postdoctoral fellow. Her research focuses on the study of the universe as a whole from the era of inflation to the present. Born and raised in Paris, she holds a bachelor's in science in mathematics and physics and a master's, master's in science in cosmology, both degrees from Pierre and Marie Curie University. 
In 2021, Koenig earned her PhD in theoretical physics from the University of California, Davis, where she worked with Professor Nemanja Kaloper, making her the ninth black woman to ever complete a doctorate in theoretical physics in the United States and the first black student to earn a PhD in physics from UC Davis. Her faculty hosts at MIT are David Kaiser and Alan Guth, and thank you again for um, nominating her and supporting her and being her host. I pass the mic now to Morgan Koenig. Can you, can you hear me? Hi, everyone. First of all, thank you for uh, being here. I want to thank the MIT community for being so welcoming. And of course, uh, my host, Alan Guth, who is here present, uh, and David Kieser, who couldn't be here today. OK, great. Uh, OK, so today I'm going to try to share with you my personal journey as a physicist and also as a black woman physicist. So this looks like a physics talk, I mean a physics title, we talk about singularity, when we talk about black holes, when we talk about the beginning of the universe. Um, but here I wanted to use that word to emphasize my experience being um, always the only black uh, physicist in every team that I have worked in. And so when I uh, mentioned resolving the singularity, we're not trying to resolve the, the black hole singularity, we're mainly trying to understand how we can improve uh, diversity um, in the, and, and, and why and why it is important to, um, to increase representation in the field of physics. Okay, so a lot of people always ask me, why did you become a cosmologist? And uh, there's, there's always kind of an interrogation about why someone like me would actually want to pursue a field that is seen to be so um, male dominated and, and where there's very few people that look like me. And in my opinion, this is actually one of the most human um, field of, uh, to study. I mean, we have all looked at the stars. We have all wondered what our place in the universe is. We have always looked at the moon and looked at the constellation for answers about where we're from. And I think this is actually one of the most human field um, to, 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 to study. Um, and I also uh, remembered uh, going back to Ivory Coast. So my mother is from Ivory Coast. My, grandpa my grandparents were always in Ivory Coast. And I remember going back there in my 20s. And when the people found out what I was studying, uh, they were not surprised at all. And they told me, yeah, but you were five years old and already asking us, <laughs> you know, what about the moon? What about the stars? What about the galaxies? Uh, but the difference between the kids there wondering about the moon and the galaxies and me is that I was given the chance to actually study it. And a lot of them were not given the chance. So today I want to tell you what I've learned in physics and I want to give you a little bit about my, uh, my own perspective on, on the field. Okay, so this is what we know. So this picture represents uh, the building blocks of everything that we see around us. This is called the standard model of particle physics. So everything that we see, the air, the, the chair, you, me, the stars, they're all made of those building blocks. Uh, and so to understand them, we have two different parts. We have this part here that's called fermions, and those here, they're called bosons. So the difference is those are going to come together to form protons, neutrons, nuclei. Um, here you can see some of them that you know, the electron that I think most people know, and then the, the, the heavier brothers or cousins of the electrons, right? And don't worry about the baby, I have also a kid, so please. <laughs> and uh, those are bosons, and th those are uh, force mediators. So basically they're going to uh, bring those particles together and tell us how they relate to each other, how they stay together, how they split, how they come back, how they combine together. And so those are all the building blocks of um, the matter that we know. So now you can wonder, how do we know that? So this is basically the equation that represents the standard model. So again, if you want to understand physics, you have to understand math and you have to be given the chance to understand uh, mathematics. So this is the description 
of the standard model. So first, it took the theory side of physics to come up with a model, to come up with equations that would describe what we see. But that is, again, not all that we need in physics. We always have to go from the theory to the experiment, back to the theory, and it's always a constant back and forth. And so what we also needed was to actually experimentally find or discover or unravel those particles. And the way we did that is with the Large Hydrant Collider CERN that is a magnificent, in my opinion, magnificent uh, human endeavor. And what it is, it's a ring that is 100 meter down. The ring is uh, 27 kilometer uh, long. And what they do is they produce proton, they accelerate the proton, and then they make the proton collide in different parts. And with all the energy that those protons make when they collide, they produce other particles that can be detected in some of the detectors that are placed at different points of this ring. So here what you see is one of the detectors, and what you're going to see here are the protons, which are those yellow dots, coming together, crashing, and then producing a lot of other particles that we can detect. Now we can, uh, we can get information about their mass, about their energy, about their spin, about their electrical charge, and make sure that the theory that has been developed uh, is actually uh, real. And so this is, uh, this is a picture of me 10 years ago when I was uh, just a baby physicist visiting the CERN. And I was just amazed. It's also, I mean, it gives you a little bit of, a, of an idea of the size, but I mean, it's, it's incredible. I always compare it to, uh, to like a cathedral. I mean, it took so many people to come together to build it that uh, I, was, I was really, really impressed. OK, but all of this, everything that I told you about this standard model of particle, this only makes a very, very small portion of the universe. Today, we know that most of the universe is made out of dark energy. And I'm not going to talk too much about it. But what's also surprising is most of matter is not the matter that we know. It's not you, me, the stars. It's actually something that we call dark matter. Um, and then again, you can always ask, how do we know that there is something called dark matter? And what is dark matter? And I can tell you that we know that there is something called dark matter, but we don't know what it is. So first of all, how do we know that there is, how do we know anything about the universe, really? So we're lucky to be able to look at the stars and to gather our information through the light that comes from the cosmos to our detector. So this is a project that is going to hopefully come to fruition in a couple of years. This is the European Extremely Large Telescope, which is um, beautiful. And it's going to be built in Chile. And so we get our information through the photons. Photons are light particles. Uh, they come, they're emitted in the early universe or through stars or galaxies. And as they make their journey to us, they tell us the history of where they were emitted and what they have seen through their path. And so that allows us to understand the makeup of the universe and the history of the universe. So what do we know today? This is a diagram that represents very broad picture, the history of the universe. So here you can see the, the time. Right? Uh, so the universe started, we don't really know how it started, but it started that we can be certain of. Uh, was it a big bang? Maybe not, but we call it the big bang. And then it evolved, it expanded extremely fast. It took a couple of thousand, hundreds of thousands of years to have the first atoms. It took a couple of millions of years to have the first stars. And then eventually we had uh, the right structure, the galaxies that we see today. So we know that the universe is roughly 14 billion years old. Uh, we know that it's homogeneous, meaning that it's the same, it's the same everywhere. It's the same in every direction. We know it's isotropic. And we know that it's made out of all the right uh, structure. So again, now how did we know about this mysterious dark matter uh, situation? So we can also look at galaxy, and in particular, we can look at galaxy rotation. So here, you can see two, two galaxies that look exactly the same. And here in this graph, um, this is a representation of the velocity 
with respect to the distance. So we know that galaxies are rotating, and we can basically figure out the velocity of every point based on their distance with respect to the center. And so if we just look at the light of the galaxy, and if we just assume that all the matter that we know of is the luminous matter, then this is the profile that we should have, theoretically speaking. But when we actually measured it, this is the profile that we got. And so what's surprising here is that there seemed to be some matter that we have not accounted for that is not luminous matter. And this is what we called dark matter. Dark because we don't see it. Um, so this was the first element that told us there is something that we don't see that's called dark matter. Now there is another proof of dark matter, and I'm not going to go too much into the detail, but this map, you can think about it as the oldest map of the universe. So in this map, there is no stars, there are no galaxies. What you see are temperature fluctuations. So the red dots are warmer, the cold dots are colder. And this is, of course, a two, uh, 2D representation of it. And this map tells you the state of the universe at 400,000 years after the Big Bang. So again, at that point, you have a lot of particles coming together. It's very dense. And by studying the relation between the, the, the hot spot and the cold spot, we can get an enormous amount of information. We can know the age. We can know the, 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 the um, composition of the universe. And in particular, we can tell that there is also something called dark matter by studying this map. So if you want to have an analogy, uh, dark matter is like basically having a suit, uh, an invisible MB, non-binary person, that would be moving. And so you know that there is someone in there, but you just cannot see it. But you know that there is something. And this analogy, I didn't make up this analogy, but Professor Tadda Prescott Weinstein, in one of her brilliant TED Talk, actually, made this uh, brilliant analogy. She was an MLK fellow as well, and she's now a professor of theoretical physics at the University of New Hampshire, and, uh, yeah, and, a, and a great inspiration. Okay, so this is where we are right now in the community. Uh, those are all the theories of dark matter. It's a little bit of a mess. There's a lot of different options, and we don't really know uh, what it is at this point, even though we know that it exists, and we know that it interacts gravitationally. So again, now I told you that all the information, or most of the information that we know uh, about the cosmos, we get them through light. The problem is that there is some limitation. We already got a lot of information, uh, but we can think, is there any other way to probe the cosmos than through light? And the other limitation that we have with light is that the oldest map that I showed you is like a wall. We cannot see anything before that. Because before that time, light was not decoupled, was not free to be emitted and come to our telescope. So again, is there another way to look at the cosmos? Is there another way to hear the cosmos? And we're very lucky to live in the area era of gravitational wave detector. So this is an interferometer. This is LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave uh, Observatory. Uh, I think this is in Louisiana. And I'm going to tell you a little bit how it works. So you have two different branches. They're both four kilometer long. And, well, and then when one of the gravitational waves goes through that, you're going to be able to observe a signal. But first, what is a gravitational wave? All right. So a gravitational wave is a wave. It's a deformation of space time. Um, so when you have massive objects in the universe, they're going to deform the space-time. One way to think about it is if you have a, a tablecloth and you, and you spread it, and you put a bowling ball in the middle, it's going to bend the tablecloth that you have. The same way, massive objects are going to bend the space-time. So here you have a binary neutron star rotating around one another that are creating a gravitational wave. The ones that were detected uh, were events that were a lot more dramatic. So here, in this case, you have two rotating black holes that are going to merge together and emit a dramatic gravitational wave. 
So this is what has been uh, detected at LIGO. So now again, how it works. So again, you have those two uh, branches that are four kilometer long. And the way that it is set up is that there's lasers coming. And if those two branches are exactly four kilometer long, the lasers is going to meet here in opposition of phase. So they're going to cancel each other. You're not going to see anything. Now, if one of the branch is stretched or shortened, um, then you're going to have a little bit of a phase difference, and you're going to observe a signal. So here you can see that when this branch gets stretched or when it's a little bit smaller, you're going to see a little bit of a signal here. You're going to know that one of the branch has been um, modified by the presence of a gravitational wave, uh, and, uh, yeah, and then you're going to see a, a signal. And so I think that this is an incredible tool that we have today, because now we're not only able to look at the cosmos, but we're also able to hear the cosmos. We're able to, to understand or, or, or look at it in a very, very different way through uh, those gravitational waves. And so one thing that, uh, that I wondered with some of my colleagues is how can we use this tool to try to get some information about uh, dark matter? How can we use the fact that there are gravitational waves that are being emitted very early in the universe, going through the universe, to our telescope or our detectors, and they also are telling us a story. They're also telling us something about where they come from and what they have seen as they make their way to our, um, to our telescopes. Okay. Um, so following this lead, um, I worked with two students, and we tried to start a a research project basically trying to use gravitational waves to get information about dark matter, about this elusive uh, matter. And so we actually uh, worked pretty well, and now we have two articles on the archive. They're being reviewed by a journal, but we're really hoping that they will be published soon. Um, and so, again, you don't have to, to go too much into the detail, but what we looked at was what we can learn from very early gravitational waves going through the cosmos and if it can give us any kind of information about the nature of dark matter. And so we looked at dark matter as a particle. We looked at dark matter as what we call primordial black holes. And we're going to keep on pushing this agenda and keep on looking uh, if we can get any kind of information. Uh, but what I'm also very proud about that project is that this is one of the projects that uh, only involves black physicists. And so this is actually incredibly rare. Uh, last year, with those two grad students and a professor at Brown, we actually wrote also an, uh, a paper on, on, on some other topic. Uh, but then it was a paper um, with the biggest collaboration of black physicists. There was four of us. So, yeah. <laughs> But slowly, slowly but surely, we're, we're making history. And I'm very proud of their work. And I think this, is, this, this really shows that it's important to work together, to um, help each other grow as physicists. And it's also a way to show that when you have black people or minority people, we actually do good physics. It's not just, OK, we want to have more black people because it's a good thing. We actually do really good work together. We actually put papers out. We are very creative together. Uh, we mentor each other. Those two students are grad students, one at Brown, one at Pittsburgh. Uh, and we show that diversity is important. And we actually are ourselves a diverse group. I mean, I'm half white. He's half Asian. So again, we really show that diversity leads to really important and, and good physics. Because at the end of the day, physics is a social science. It's not a social science. It's a hard science. But it's a science made out of people. So I talked to you about the LHC. Uh, this is, I think this is CMS. I'm never sure if it's CMS or I think it's one of the detector. And those are all the people that worked on building this one detector. Yeah, in, it takes a lot of people. And when you have a lot of people working together, those issues are going to matter. Because we need different point of view. We need different kind of people. We need different way of thinking 
uh, to bring together better and better physics. And so now I want to share with you a couple of numbers so that you really can grasp what is the physics community like uh, and, and why when I type physicist on Google image or female physicist on Google image, there's never a black person coming up. <laughs> okay, so here you have a uh, diagram that shows the percentage of, um, of degrees in physics, bachelor, master's, and PhD based on race. On race. And the, um, uh, the black line is the national, uh, uh, the, the, the national representation in the US. And so you can see clearly that white people are overrepresented and that black and indigenous are underrepresented by a lot, by an enormous amount. Um, so I mean, again, those are the facts. And I think that there's a lot that we can do here. I think that there's a lot that's being done, not enough. I mean, I know that I couldn't be here if people hadn't supported me, if people hadn't believed in me. And I'm, again, super grateful for the opportunity given here at MIT. Uh, but I mean, again, this is between 2017 and 2021, but still. I think we have a lot of, of work to do. Uh, I also wanted to emphasize the difference also between men and women, especially between black women and white men. So here, between uh, 1973 and 2012, I couldn't find uh, a recent results. But um, the time that it took black women to get 66, P 66 black women to get PhDs in physics, 22,000 white men got PhDs in physics, which means that for every single black woman who got a PhD in physics, there are 333 white men that got a PhD in physics. Uh, so those are important numbers, I think. So then, I mean, I'm, I'm French, but I'm also African. <laughs> Most of my family is in Ivory Coast. And so I also wondered, what is the participation of African countries in the physics field? Um, and so I found this map of the CERN. Uh, where you can see all of the countries that participate in uh, work or, or participate in the, the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider of the CERN. And I think, again, I, I was amazed going there. And it also prides itself for being one of the most beautiful international collaboration. And it is very international. But it seems that there's a part of the world that's missing once more. Uh, and if we take all of the physicists coming from sub-Saharan Africa, not including South Africa, for obvious reasons, then we found that there are 38. 38 out of basically 13,000 people that are from African countries, uh, which represents uh, less than 0.3% of African people working in physics. Um, then I went even more, and so those are diagrams that I did with, uh, with my husband who also worked in data, and we actually wanted to, to see the output of papers by Nature. Nature is a very prestigious um, journal, and we wanted to look at the output per continent. And so obviously Europe is dominating, and uh, Asia and North America, and, and here we're left again with Africa with almost uh, no papers. But one can also say, OK, but you also have to look at the population, right? And so this is the population. And so this is the research output per 1 million population. And so we can see, again, that there is an over-representation of the Western world. Oceania is, is basically Australia, right? So we have North America, we have Europe, we have Australia, and then we have the rest of the world. And then here we have Africa. So almost no output. And when I looked at that, I actually thought it was pretty sad. But then all of a sudden, I saw a paper coming from Cote d'Ivoire, my mother's country. I got really excited. There's one physicist in Cote d'Ivoire. I looked at the paper. It was some uh, geology. I looked at the guys. I googled the, 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 the researcher's name. It was a white guy. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, even those numbers may not represent the entire truth, unfortunately. Um, and why this is important. It's not only important because we want to be good human, because we think that this is a good thing and we need a diverse body of physicists. This is also important because Africa is going to be the youngest continent. Africa is going to have the most people and going to have the youngest people. And we are going to be faced with incredible challenges in the next 
100 years. And if we do not give the tools to the young people to solve the problem of this world, we are shooting ourselves in the, in the foot, I think. And so we have to address that problem even in a completely selfish perspective that we have to survive and we need people to find solutions. So here, for example, you can see the projection of, uh, of the world population per continent. And although right now is, Asia is dominating, there is a projection that says that by 2100, uh, there will be almost as many people in Africa as in Asia. And you can see that the speed of the growth of the population in Africa is way larger uh, than in any other continent, which also tells you that Africa, again, is going to have the youngest population. Now we're going to have an aging population in most of the Western world. And so it's really crucial to, I think, to address that and to make sure that uh, we create connections, we create conversations, uh, we create collaborations with African countries. I mean, personally, I have been giving talks in the US a lot. I have gone to conference in Europe. I have never given one single talk in Africa, not once. Uh, so yeah, here in this plot, I also just want to show you, I mean, it's the same story uh, represented a little bit different. That also tells you that the growth of the African population is going to be um, yeah, quite impressive. And so again, this is just my own personal experience of being, I'm not so different from those kids. I mean, my ancestors come from this exact village and were probably in this exact school. This picture was taken a couple of years ago when I went back to my ancestors' village. And I decided to teach those kids because it was the summer and they were a bit bored. I mean, they normally go to school, but I just wanted to share with them my passion of mathematics and physics. Uh, and the difference between them and me is that I was actually given the chance to study it. I was given the chance um, to pursue my passion, to ask the right questions, and to be able to go uh, and to, to fulfill my, my curiosity. And what I noticed is that, I mean, the class is almost full. It's summer. They don't have to come. They all came. They were incredibly smart. They were incredibly hardworking. And when I asked one of the smartest what he wanted to do, he told me he wanted to be a taxi driver because there's nothing else, and that was the ceiling for him. And so this is, again, this is another picture. And so, and so this is, um, in a way, my pledge to, again, build more connection and just try to find for talent everywhere so that the little girl who is looking at the stars can actually go and pursue her passion or his passion uh, to, uh, to work and to understand physics. And for the little story, I spent a couple of days trying to look for a picture like this. And so I Googled black child looking at the stars, African child looking at the stars, African child looking at the night sky, black child looking at the moon. <laughs> I tried everything on DuckDuckGo on Google and I couldn't find anything. So this is actually AI generated with Dali, yeah. Which I think is also a little bit problematic that I just couldn't find any of those pictures. Uh, so again, this is just my own experience, my own take on it. And I just want to say that I was one of those kids. The only difference is I was lucky enough to be able to pursue physics. And I think that there's an enormous amount of talent, an enormous amount of brilliant physicists to become. And that I really hope that in the next couple of years, we will be able to make programs, we will be able to create bridges. I hope that MIT will be able to see that Africa is not just a place with starving children that need to be given food, but actually a place where we can find solutions, where we can do good physics together, and that we can actually build uh, a better physics community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Morgane. Um, so now we have time for some um, questions and comments. So I also am mindful of our folks joining us virtually. So please use the chat function and we will certainly um, bring your questions or comments to uh, Morgane's attention. How about folks in this space? Any comments or questions that you have? OK. 
keep in mind, not my area of expertise. <laughs> But the map you showed about that you called a wall, because right. we can't see before it, yeah. how was that created? So should I think of it as this is archival work that somebody did at some point, or it's now we have figured this out looking backward and how does so that work, if the, you will? I think the really cool thing about cosmology is that uh, you can think of cosmology a little bit like uh, archaeology of space. And so if you want to look into the past, you just have to look far. Because the photon have a certain speed, and it takes them a certain amount of time to reach us. So if you look at the sun, don't do it, but if you look at the sun, <laughs> you, you would actually see the sun eight minutes in the past. Yeah, because it takes those photons eight minutes to come from the sun to your eye. And so as you go, and as you look further and further away, you actually look in the past. And so that map was built by uh, the Planck telescope that tried to look for the oldest photon, basically, the photon from very far away, and that gave us an idea of the, of the state of the universe at that time. Morgan, thank you so very much for this beautiful presentation, and it was wonderful to hear you weave your personal journey with regards to this and how it relates to your ancestral lands and the people and community who you care about over there. Um, I have uh, two questions, one related to interdisciplinarity, since um, um, my collaborator, Corey Diane, and I are working on um, a potential acoustic engineering sound project related to gravitational waves. But what has really inspired me to this is understanding African fractals and African cosmology and indigenous cosmology. And so I was wondering, um, because you, you're an expert in this field and I'm not, um, how open do you think the scientists and physicists are to incorporating indigenous and African cosmologies into understanding the, the universe? You mean today? The, the, today. The cosmology, uh, I think not at all. Not at all? Okay. No, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm going to give you an honest answer. I think Thank that you. there is absolutely no wish or, or no effort to try to include indigenous um, knowledge. I think that it's a very wide field. And it has worked. I mean, somehow it also has led to a lot of, of, of wonderful results. And I think that maybe we're blinding ourselves, thinking that the past 100 years were pretty amazing in terms of physics, I have to say. Um, but there is very little wish. But also, how can, they be, uh, how can they be an effort to understand indigenous culture when they're not indigenous people in the field? I mean, you have to be able to ask the right questions. And when you don't even know that this is a thing, how would you even expect a white person to ask this kind of question, I think? So, I mean, you, we need a more diverse body of physicists, and then maybe those questions will be raised. I think they're incredibly important. An, exa an example I can give is um, there was a story about uh, people studying glaciers. And the way that Western people study glaciers, many white men, is how big they are, how tall they are. You know, it's, it's all of this metric. And then by talking to the indigenous people and, and, and listening to the, to the tales, they realized that um, the indigenous people thought about glaciers as feminine and masculine. And that actually corresponded to a much better classification than looking at them in terms of, of height and, and, and mass. And that in nature, those glaciers, those feminine and, and masculine glaciers, were actually very different. And so by incorporating indigenous knowledge, they were able to advance the science. So I do believe it's incredibly important. And when it comes to cosmology, every single civilization had a cosmology. Cosmology means the study of your environment, right? So I mean, in the beginning, it's just the caves, but eventually, it's just the animals, but eventually, it's the cosmos. And you can see traces of cosmology in Northern Europe, in Africa, <coughs> in Egypt. For the moment there was a culture, there was a cosmology. So I think that it would be also very interesting to, to look into it, and it's not been done at all. Yeah. So, OK. Yeah, and then, then I'm going <laughs> to. So, um, oh, goodness. It's uh, first, the uh, first comment is that the, um, the image that you showed at the end, it, that story would be like really good. I, I'm, I was just thinking about like uh, my friend Natrice Gaskins, who's, who wrote uh, Techno Vernacular. Um, oh, goodness. Techno, techno Vernacular Creativity and Innovation, I believe it is. Yes, um, that that would be a great story because she she does a lot of um, collaboration with AI uh, generated images and stuff like that. Um, 
I had a really um, weird like curiosity in terms of like the gravitational waves and then the um, the accelerating expansion of the universe. And, you know, is there perhaps like a point where the, the universe is going to decelerate in expansion because of the passing of the gravitational waves? So, so far, we do not believe that the universe is going to decelerate. We actually, right now, we're in a phase of accelerated expansion, which was not always the case. So in the history of the universe, there is inflation, where you have one of the <laughs> forefathers yeah. of inflation right there, Alan Good. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, very, it's, it's in the beginning of the universe. The uh, universe expands incredibly fast. And then it's going to be radiation dominated, matter dominated, dark energy dominated. So the universe expands constantly, but not at the same rate. And so recently, with the dark energy uh, domina dominated universe, it is accelerating uh, in an exponential way. We don't think it's going to decelerate. Mm. Uh, but about this, some people... Uh, say that cosmology is going to become a religion because as the universe expands incredibly fast, at some point, we may not be able to see any other galaxies because the universe would be so mm -hmm. spread out and then you would have to believe cosmologists for the knowledge of the... Yeah. And then the, 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 the second question that I had, sorry for hogging the mic, um, you, you pointed out uh, nature and all of the disparities and it really brought to mind uh, some stories from earlier this year in terms of like the, the research ethics and how um, work is being done within anthro anthropology on indigenous peoples, but not necessarily often without the consultation of indigenous peoples. So <clears throat> wondering like how we can actually challenge uh, some of these models of like constantly publishing and, you know, coming up against like these, these these ethics boards or these ethics models that have like really big loopholes that actually like foster these disparities. Yeah, I mean, I think those are those are big questions, and I don't I don't have all the solutions. I think it's it's crucial to to understand and to accept what indig indig indigenous people are telling us. There is, as you probably know, there is this project of a telescope being built in Hawaii, the TMT telescope. Uh, that is uh, supposedly going to be built on a holly mountain, and I think, again, I am not an indigenous of this of this part of the of the earth, but I think it's it's important to to acknowledge uh, what they're saying. Um, as far as Africa is concerned, I know that there are a lot of telescopes in Namibia, um, because you you need you need a desert. So if if you don't have a lot of of light pollutions, meaning if you if you're far away from a city, then it's a it's a pretty good. Uh, spots to put a telescope. I know people that went there, um, but I think there is almost no effort done into incorporating uh, the local population. I mean, there's this idea that, okay, you're gonna create some jobs, but there is no um, bridge made with the local universities. Uh, there is no education made with the, with the local uh, children there. And again, when I was back in, the, in my village, it's called Kodyusu, uh, I actually gave a somewhat of a, of a, also a physics talk. I told them about what I was doing. It was packed full, they were so happy, they had never heard that. I mean, there's very, very little effort uh, made to bring physics to, to the children there. Not that I know of. And even when I ask here, because I mean, with this program, I actually wanted to go to Africa. I thought, okay, that would be great. Maybe MIT has some collaboration with some African universities and I would love to go. I couldn't find anything. So I think I, I just think there's nothing that's being done, and now how to do it I don't know because it would have to start from scratch. But it's, it's an important question. So along those lines, this is the second physicist talk that I've been in, um, and so I always ask this whenever I meet physicists. I always ask this question: <clears throat> the nuclear physicists, theoretical physicists, particle physicists, like what is the industry of physics? Like what does that look like? So. In certain businesses, you know, it's like, oh, you know, biologists, you're going to work in pharma. You, you know, if you're, you know, a poet, you're going to go work at whatever, you know. <laughs> but it seems like physicists don't have, like, a solid answer, like, what the end game is in terms of, like, a business. Or, like, you know, like, what's the industry of it? Other than, like, oh, well, you can go back and be a teacher. Right. You know, most people aren't built to be teachers, you know, kind of a thing. So, you know, when I speak to students here and some of my students... I always say like, you know, the world needs more physicists, 
you know, we don't need more basketball players, more rappers, we need more physicists. But then I'm kind of like stuck when it's like, well, how am I going to get paid? You know, like what's the kind of that piece? So do you have any insights uh, into my silly question? Well, yes and no. First of all, there's different areas of physics. I mean, you can do uh, more material science physics and then there are more applications. You can work on crystallography, there's more application, direct application with the industry. I think it's also incredibly important to keep funding fundamental physics that do not seem to have an industry application because there will be an industry application at some point and we don't know that yet. I mean, without general relativity, you would not have uh, any GPS, right? Without quantum mechanics, you would not have any headphones. But it's not the people that, that build those theories did not do that so that they could like walk in the streets with their headphones and looking at their Google Maps, right? I mean, I don't think that was the goal. So they, they didn't know actually that there would be some uh, application to it, but they are, and it completely changed our lives today. I mean, quantum mechanics, general relativity, all of this, even particle physics change our lives. I'm gonna give you an example. If you wanna cure, um, cure cancer and if you wanna destroy some tumors, you have to send some particles in and localize it in the tumor, right? And one way to do that is to use some certain particles that you can, that you can send. You can send some protons, even better, you can send some antiprotons, and you can localize it even better, and you can actually cure cancer. Again, the people that develop particle physics did not think about those applications, but today, those are industry applications. So I, I understand that it's difficult to say, okay, why would I fund, uh, why, why, why would I get funding? I'm a cosmologist, I think about dark matter. Who cares about dark matter? Who cares about the beginning of the universe? But if we stop funding this, we're, we're also gonna slow down the entire industry. And the last example I wanna tell you is that there is also constant um, connection between fundamental physics and the industry. When the CERN was built, it was incredibly difficult to build this. And so the engineers and the physicists that build it works, work with the industry and share their knowledge and share um, uh, like parts of the LHC, part of the Large Hadron, uh, Large Hadron Collider that can actually be uh, used in the industry to make, I don't know, bigger magnets or, or faster or more solid materials. Uh, so there is a constant back and forth between the industry and, uh, and physics. Uh, but yeah, I mean, again, I know that for a lot of people, fundamental physics seems like this really out there uh, field, but I mean, it is crucial. The reason why the US is the way it is is because it actually funded fundamental physics. At least I really believe it. Um, we have a question virtually before I um, pass it on again to our in-person questions. So um, the question that we received is, what is the most pivotal opportunity or experience you think that we can provide to achieve your mission? That's a really good question. Um, I think that there are universities in Africa. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, I think that as a kid being told, look, there is this amazing thing called physics, there's this amazing thing called cosmology. I, my parents are not academic people. I didn't know what cosmology was. I didn't know what particle physics was. I was lucky enough to grow up in the part of the world where I had access to people coming to talk to us and tell us, hey, this exists, and this is something you can do. I think this would be the first step to actually go to those communities and to say, hey, this is incredibly important and you can also participate in it in a way and then, of course, I mean, we always need money, right? We need to also be able to, to fund this. But the first thing would be to make connection with universities in Africa, because there are universities in Africa. So. Hi. Thank you again for everything. This has been really eye-opening as someone who doesn't have a STEM background. But um, I, it, I think it's important for especially folks who are marginalized, I think it's important for us to be able to communicate our, our, our work out across different cohorts and constituencies because this is, this is part of like the learning that happens. This is what makes higher ed so wonderful. So I, I wanna say thank you because that doesn't always happen. I can be in a room where I'm like, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> so I really appreciate that. This was a really great breakdown. Um, I have one question and then comment. One comment um, is that what I really appreciated about your talk, especially about dark matter, is that even within STEM, there are conversations that are not quite like um, solidified. We're still researching it. We're still we're still figuring it out. It's like there's still an incredible amount of room to grow and understand more and more complexity, because I 
as someone with a liberal arts background um, coming into and, and teaching DEI in STEM spaces, that's often um, that's often like a barrier in the conversation, um, especially STEM folks often communicate to me that like STEM is more tangible, right? That more tangible than identity politics, right? There's, there's, I can understand more, I can understand the X, Y, and Z of it. When that's not, when, when learning about <laughs> this very notion that that's not necessarily true, not all of STEM is something that we all know. It's not all, it's not all completely tangible. It's something that we can, just like identity politics, it's something that's constant, Con consistently growing and it's complex and there are things we absolutely don't know and are willing to learn so like this really helped me um this this gave me something for my skill set pocket to, to to be able to take in those spaces so thank you for that and my question is um whenever if you've ever found yourself in that kind of conversation right where like how d your identity informs the work that you do right it informs like why you're in this space or maybe um um, informs your passion for this. Like, do you find that, and like, do you find that this is, is a conversation that you're always open to having? Like, is, cause sometimes I find that like, you, sometimes you just want to talk about your work, right? right. You know, like it, you, it, it, sometimes when you find yourself in spaces where, um, where you, you're going to talk about your work, but someone always inevitably comes with the question, well, as a black woman, you know, like, and you're like, actually, I'm just here to talk about <laughs> the science, you know, like, how do you, um, right. how do you choose like the spaces that you're invited in to be able to talk through that and to, to really, um, um, really, really like share that experience? Cause it's not all spaces I'm assuming. So That's true. I, I, I think that, um, I mean, first and foremost, I'm a physicist and I like to talk about my research. And I've been lucky enough to, on, to be in groups where I wasn't always been, oh, you're, you're a black woman, how is it for you as a black woman? That actually hasn't happened so much. Mm -hmm. And so I think that people have been really man, mindful of this. And, and so also here at MIT, I have to say, that I've been uh, very pleasantly surprised. And uh, it's been a very good experience. I think it's mainly something that, uh, that I bring up. I feel like I take the time to bring it up. I take the time to talk about it. I, I don't feel any pressure. Um, but of course, there's always the fear of, uh, you know, being kind of labeled as the one person that brings up difficult uh, subjects. Uh, I, I do think that there is a little bit of an awakening that people understand that those topics are important to discuss. So I think uh, compared to a couple of years ago, I think after the Black Lives Matter movement, actually there, there has been a, a difference in the field, which is good. Um, I still don't think that there is enough that's being done, to be honest. But it's, it's, a, it's a complicated uh, problem because, I mean, if you want more black women professors, you need more black women uh, PhDs. And if you want more black women PhDs, you have more black women in, in the bachelor. I mean, it's, it's a very complicated, uh, and there's a lot that needs to be done. Um, but I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm, maybe, maybe I'm naive, but I'm hopeful. Yeah, yeah, I had a couple of, let's say, quick questions. But one, I was wondering, what is your personal opinion of what existed before time zero of the Big Bang? <laughs> quick, quick question. And then second, a little bit more technical, you've written about gravity waves. You know, why isn't it a waste of time to look for gravitons? Why That's should... Waited? Gravitons. Why isn't it a waste of time to look ah, for gravitons? Why should the transmission of gravity through space-time take the form of a particle and not just a wave? Are we forced into that duality all the time because of what we understand in quantum physics? But anyway, you can yeah, 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 answer one or two or both. Or yeah, both. So uh, the, the, time, the, the time equals zero question, I get that a lot, and I always give the same answer. I'm a physicist. I'm not a philosopher. Right. I mean, this is a philosophy question. We physicists, we look at phenomena and we try to explain them using mathematics. Right. What happened before time? Was it time before time? Can you talk about time before the time even existed? Those, <laughs> right. I mean, those are all questions that I think are important questions. But I think that my colleagues that do uh, metaphysics or, or philosophy probably will be better equipped to to answer. Is there a God? Did God? I, I don't know. I don't know those questions, and I'm not bothered by those questions. Um, now, why is it a waste of time to look for the graviton? I mean, that also you can ask half of the people working at the CTP work in quantum gravity. <laughs> so I think that, uh, I think it's an important question. Uh, I mean, it, it seems to be natural to want to unify all the forces. And so I think it's a, 
it's uh, it's it's an, it's a natural uh, path to to doing to doing physics in my in my opinion. Um, now, did you ask anything about the gravitational wave? Like, is it or just more about graviton? To to have graviton as yeah, but for many years it also didn't seem to make sense that uh, that light was a particle. I mean, in the same way, right? I mean, it was also incredibly counterintuitive. So. Um, I think, I think that's, that's something that's important to understand is that unfortunately with modern physics, with quantum gravity, our intuition is usually going to lead us in the wrong uh, path. Yeah. So we are about time, unless there are last, any final comments before we wrap up. I'm waiting, I'll give um, our virtual participants a few seconds just to see if there are any other comments that you'd like to share with Morgane. And while waiting for any other additional comments, I did not get to acknowledge our other scholars. So I want to just um, give a moment and acknowledge Katie, who's in this space physically joining us virtually. I also saw um, Angelica Maiolo. Um, she joined us virtually. And um, who else? Christine Taylor Butler. So I had to look at this picture just to remind myself who else was I was missing. So I just want to acknowledge, thank you for joining us virtually. So this is our cohort, as you can see here in the poster. And Javid Drake. Javid Drake, too, is also um, who joined us virtually. So one last look at um, any, any comments in the chat? All righty. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, it was a pleasure seeing all of you. Don't forget, next week, Wednesday, Louis Messiah, that's the 18th, 12 to 1. Hybrids, you join us in person here in the um, Bush Room or join us virtually, and we will send you the Zoom link. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Um, for the scholars who are physically here, I'd like to take some photos with you and Morgan, please. Please stay.